Okay, this is the continuation of Chapter 3 on the Culture of Innovativeness. Another facilitator of innovativeness in high-tech companies is something that is called a Skunk Works. A Skunk Works is a new venture team that is physically isolated from the normal corporate offices. And in this sense, they've given free reign to operate outside the normal rules and procedures of corporate innovation. This started in Lockheed Martin in the aerospace industry, and since then other companies such as General Motors and Ford have Skunk Works. And when IBM decided it needed to leave the mainframe business and get into PCs, it physically located a team of developers in Research Triangle, North Carolina, far away from the corporate headquarters in New York. And the idea here is when this new venture team is given free reign for innovativeness, they can come up with products that will definitely challenge the company's status quo and new business models. One of the most uh, discussed disadvantages of a Skunk Works, however, is that if the only way that a company can truly be innovative is to isolate the innovativeness outside the company boundaries, it's a signal that there's something more fundamental that needs to be addressed. It's like putting a band-aid on a symptom of a problem rather than addressing the root cause. And it can be very difficult to get these uh, skunk works integrated back into the company when they have accomplished their objectives. For example, when Charles Schwab decided that it wanted to do online trading, it had a skunk works. And the reason that it needed to isolate its team to explore online trading from the regular company is because most salespeople were compensated on commission. And this was definitely going to disrupt the commission structure. And at that point, when Charles Schwab decided to proceed with its online trading business model, there was a lot of sabotage that went on when those folks were reintegrated back into the company, even in terms of things like who got assigned good office space. So Skunk Works can be beneficial, but they can also have serious drawbacks as well. I always like the uh, background of language. I really like interesting vocabulary. The term Skunk Works originated during the Prohibition era of United States when alcohol sales were illegal and many distilleries were hidden away in the Appalachian Mountains. And of course, to stir the mash and cook it to make the liquor was a stinky process. And so these illicit distilleries were called Skunk Works. And for my international students, a skunk is a little black and white animal that emits um, a very strong odor through its scent glands that's very stinky. Another facilitator of innovativeness is what's called a learning orientation. And a learning orientation addresses the degree to which a company is able to bring new insights into the company to essentially come up with new ideas. And what you'll see as we discuss Chapter 4 is that this learning orientation is based on data. It's a market-based approach to innovation. And we're lucky that our book, one of the co-authors, Stan Slater, is one of the foremost experts on learning orientation in the strategy field. Paradoxically, even while a company has to engage in learning to be innovative, it simultaneously must engage in unlearning. For every new practice that a company wants to adopt, typically it's going to have to abandon old practices that may hamper the adoption of new ideas. And it's very difficult to unlearn. It's kind of like teaching the old dog new tricks. It's very difficult to break ingrained habits. Corporate imagination refers to a sense of playful creativity within the organizational culture. 
Many companies are known as having kind of zany workplace pr practices that facilitate this sense of playfulness. And essentially, having a corporate imagination allows a company to think outside existing boundaries. When a company does this, they don't have to stick with normal assumptions about the existing technology capabilities. When you see this phrase, overturn price performance assumptions, you should be thinking jump to a new technology life cycle. When you see escape the tyranny of the served market, you should be thinking of who are new customer markets that we could serve with our new ideas. And an openness to new ideas for innovation outside the company boundaries. Google, in fact, has a special space in its New York office that is bio-inspired. And biomimicry is a protocol for innovation with the idea being that when people have a nature-based setting, it can open up new ways of thinking to solve existing problems. And the outcome of this should be leading customers to what is possible, rather than simply delivering what they say that they need today. Expeditionary marketing is a term that is not used so much anymore. The term in favor now is called The Lean Startup. The Lean Startup is a book based on the idea of agility. The word lean often means agile, and agile means being able to look at the market and enter it with the idea of not being perfect, but making many quick entries into the marketplace in order to learn get market feedback to test our hypotheses about what customers want, how competitors will react, and to refine that and keep moving forward. And if we use the metaphor of baseball, the lean startup or agile methodology essentially says, rather than really going for the home run, which in high technology marketing would be lots of time in the lab to refine, 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 to get the best technology possible, and then go into the marketplace. This actually says the more times you can have at bat is going to enable success. It's a totally different philosophy. And the idea here is we have many experiments in the marketplace to accumulate our market knowledge in order to understand what's going to be successful. This graph shows the relationship between time on the horizontal axis and product quality on the vertical axis. The Lean Startup is based on not trying to refine the technology to be perfect before we release it, which would be a Model 3 approach, but essentially to go into the market when we have an idea or a rough prototype and to get feedback on that idea. And this will allow us to better calibrate our offering to have a clear value proposition that differentiates it from competitors and also meets customer needs. Another facilitator of innovativeness is how a firm not only tolerates risk, it needs to be um, not too risk averse, but in fact rewards risk-taking. Now this idea of tolerating mistakes and even rewarding risk-taking is very difficult for companies because companies don't feel like they can afford to make mistakes. It could damage their reputation, it costs money on ideas that don't work. But in high tech to be innovative, we have to be open to failure because not everything will, will work. So this idea of being open to fail failure can actually be built into the organizational culture through a reward system. At Google, one way that people are evaluated is how many of their ideas in the past year failed, with the idea that if you don't have any ideas that failed, you're not thinking outside the box enough and you're playing it a little too safe. And when we can learn from these so-called mistakes, it actually can set us up for su success in the future. And in fact, some venture capitalists believe that until an entrepreneur has had a failure in the market, 
they haven't really learned from their mistakes and don't have that basis of knowledge to be successful in the future. That's not necessarily widely shared, but it is one perspective. I've already mentioned having compensation for risk-taking. It's also important that inventors be compensated for their inventions. Most inventors sign, most scientists sign, an invention assignment clause when they go to work. And in this case, it means that the company owns the patents or the ideas that were developed on the job. And some people feel that the company profits unfairly from their own ideas. An appropriate reward system sets up a way to compensate inventors for their inventions where they can actually share in the revenue stream from those ideas. Some people are actually paid for every patent that they submit that gets um, approved. And even in the university system, university scientists the, their inventions belong to the university. And so if those ideas are commercialized, we do have a royalty sharing program so that those inventors actually get a royalty stream from their inventions. This can require a long-term perspective because it takes a long time to, from idea to commercialization in the marketplace. And again, just using academics as an example, uh, typically we're evaluated not just on an annual process but on a three-year process or even a seven-year process with the idea that many ideas take a long time to come to fruition and to be published even in the academic journals. Other facilitators of innovativeness are listed in Table 3.1 and I'll go through a few of those here. Biodiversity and heterogeneity are one of the most important building blocks for survival in nature. And that is true in companies as well. Diversity can be captured through different disciplines that are brought together. For example, companies today are trying to hire chemists to work with the engineers, to work with biologists, to have this diversity of perspectives. It can also include diversity in gender, diversity in age, diversity in ethnicity. And putting all these different perspectives into the pot and stirring it allows new insights to emerge. Innovative customers can also be a source of new insights. Innovative customers oftentimes have uh, problems that the mainstream market doesn't have and those innovative customers work with their vendors to invent solutions to their problems. Especially in the manufacturing arena, if a company needs to come up with a new invention and make it, they have to have new manufacturing technologies. Tesla had to invent quite a few new technologies to make their factory efficient. Con uh, Counterintuitively to um, creativity being constrained by evaluation, in this case, evaluating the progress of new innovation projects can actually help guide them to be more successful over time so that it's bounded into something that's useful. Employees who have considerable freedom of action tend to be an indicator of more innovative cultures. At Google, employees are given 20% of their time to work on projects that are unrelated to their current sphere of responsibilities. Google also has a learning series where they bring in outside experts, I think it's once a month, I can't remember, that anybody can go hear people um, on a variety of topics ranging from you know, software algorithms to biomimicry to um, healthcare in emerging markets. Emerging trends oftentimes give insights about what is going to be happening in the future. Cross-functional teams and communication are also important to innovativeness. Google has a very unique knowledge management system and it allows the company to identify experts and to tap into their expertise for particular projects. Core rigidities essentially are straitjackets that 
arise from core competencies. When we're really good at something, it constrains the way that we proceed and it makes it difficult for us to learn new skills. And in high-tech companies that experience core rigidities, it makes it difficult for them to find a fresh perspective or new rules for competition. For example, a better place is a car company that decided rather than making money on selling cars, it would make money by selling a subscription plan for electricity. The battery is the most expensive component of the car and by the better place owning the battery and having a battery swapping system, it allowed the car price to be subsidized by the company in a totally different business model. And of course existing car companies that make money on the gross margin of their vehicles would have had a very difficult time envisioning a business model like this. That business model came from the founder of a better place who uh, was a network programmer in the telecommunications industry. Very important core rigidity in high-tech companies is the status preference that technical personnel such as engineers and programmers and other scientists are given over marketing personnel. And the reason that this is a very big disadvantage for high-tech companies is one of the most important sources of knowledge in a high-tech company comes from the market. And presumably marketing personnel carry the voice of the customer and possible market applications in order to mix those ideas in with the R&D team. But when the R&D team views marketing personnel as second class citizens, their ideas and uh, information they share are not as respected as they might be to help uh, bring that new knowledge in. Core rigidities can be overcome, it can be very difficult, and we've already talked about the importance of unlearning. To review the innovator's dilemma, Clayton Christensen's book is called The Innovator's Dilemma. Jerry Tellis, the professor at USC that I mentioned, calls this the incumbent's curse. And as you see here, we've got both the definition as well as the source of the incumbent's curse and how to overcome the problem. That concludes Chapter 3.